Well, my name's Matt. It's my awesome privilege as part of our preaching series called Together in One Place to bring a message today about community. But specifically, I want to talk about community for our children and the next generation. Uh, Before I start, I'd like to take a moment to pray, always hand it over to God. Heavenly Father, thank you for this awesome privilege and opportunity. Thank you for your people, for all of us gathered here today and those online. We pray that you'll speak to us through your word today, that you'll impart something to us that we can take into our week. And I pray as always when I'm talking about you, God, that you may increase so that I might decrease. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tommy pointed out to me before the service that I wore this shirt last time I preached, and I don't think I've worn it since. So it might be my preaching shirt now, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, so I'm looking exactly the same as last time, but here we go. We'll get into it. Uh, So biblical text. So first slide, please, Mace, if you can there, mate. Oh, yep, there's the title. Next slide. Awesome. Hey, how cool is it that I'm bringing a message about the next generation and raising leaders and my son, Mason, is running the PowerPoint for me this morning. So good. So good. He's doing an awesome job. All right. So in 1 Chronicles 28, 9 to 10, in the message, it says, And you, Solomon, my son, get to know well your father's God. Serve him with a whole heart and eager mind. For God examines every heart and sees through every motive. If you seek him, he'll make sure you find him. But if you abandon him, he'll leave you for good. Look sharp now. God has chosen you to build his holy house. Be brave, determined, and do it. Very powerful words. Now, last week, Brendo brought an absolute ripper of a message, and he used this opening verse too. Me and him didn't talk about it or compare notes, but God put the same verse on both of our hearts to open our sermons. So there's got to be something there. There must be. He wouldn't bring it to both of us for no reason. I want to take a slightly different look at this verse. So Brendo was talking about looking sharp, doing it, being in the room, about that motivation. And for someone like me who struggles with procrastination, it was a very challenging message, but it was good. I got a lot out of it. Today, I want to look at how this verse talks to us about the next generation, So this was King David's encouragement to his son about building the temple. I was talking to Pastor Luke this week, and he was also encouraging me. And I stole a little bit of his wisdom, and I used some of it in the pre-service this morning. I'm going to bring a little bit about it now too, just so we feel like he's still in the room. David bought the threshing floor for 30 shekels that the temple was eventually built on. He started the process, but it was never God's intention for him to finish it. It was his job, however, to raise a son and a leader that would finish it, and raise him he did. Solomon was one of the wisest and most well-respected men to ever live, for most of his life anyway, but that's a whole different sermon. Um, David didn't build the temple himself, but he started the project, and then he invested and he taught his son in the ways of God so well that his son was able to finish it long after David was gone. Next slide there, please, Mays. Beautiful. Here we go. Now, I think I heard someone say this morning this was the verse of the day. So this might have something to do with um, you know, God putting it on my heart too. Because in your version this morning, this was what it was about. So it's Matthew 18, 19 to 20. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. And this is a, you know, everyone's favorite verse about community. I think there's something in it. It actually reminds me of a dream I had a few weeks ago. Now, normally my dreams are just insane. I'm a banana. I'm singing in a choir. The rest of them are vegetables. Tom's playing the drums, but his arms are spaghetti. They're nuts. But this dream was actually from God, and that rarely happens to me. So when it does, I listen and I pay attention. So in this dream, I'm walking through this beautiful garden, My kids are with me, Soph, my lovely wife's with me, other members of the church. And as we're walking around this lovely garden, there's this beautiful noise, like a sound of a symphony being played. I feel this warmth come over me. I feel the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm just loving it. We're just in the moment. And then as I come around a corner in this garden, I'm on my own. The sound dies down. I can't feel the warmth. And I start to think, maybe the sound is being made by my movement. So I'm walking around the garden. Then I'm jogging around the garden. Then I'm sprinting around. I won't do that. I don't want to fall over like Nat did this morning. I'm sprinting around the garden and nothing's happening. I can't recapture this sound, this noise, this beautiful experience that I was in. Anyway, eventually I stop running and I'm like, that's not working. I come back around the corner 
and I'm back surrounded by everyone. I'm holding my kids' hands. We start walking around the garden together again, and this beautiful sound comes back emanating through the entire garden. I can feel this warmth come over me, this peace, love, joy. And then I wake up, and I'm like, well, that was awesome, but I have no idea what it had anything to do with. So it turns out it might have been something to do with this message. The picture that was being painted for me, I believe what God was showing me, that whilst having an intimate relationship with him is essential and wonderful, when that relationship is shared with other Christians, it's truly a beautiful thing. And it can lead to this wonderful sound or community being created. He was showing me that Jesus cares deeply about the next generation, about what we are sowing into those who are coming after us, and how when we do this in community, we create something beautiful and life-changing. What we sow will be reaped by so many more. We may not see it, just like David didn't get to see Solomon build the temple, but we know from the promises of God that he will see the work he started through to completion. In Philippians 1 verse 6, it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will carry it out to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. We can achieve this by being in the room together, by being in community. Now, I know firsthand it's becoming less and less popular to listen to the physical community and submit to authority. Kids are influenced by social media, music, and a world that's telling them they should do whatever they want, whenever they want, because nothing really matters and the world sucks anyway. That's the message being driven. This message is one of the many reasons I gave up social media a couple of years ago. It was crushing me and there was nothing good on there. I was stuck in the doom scroll, just wasting my time and the messaging was horrible. I gave it up. We know as the church from the promises of God and his desire for his creation that this message is a lie. It's not the case. And how we behave and the way we treat others and the legacy we leave and the community we are a part of and the authority we submit to matters. In fact, it's some of the founding principles of our faith. So how do we buck the trend? How do we stand up in the face of a world that is all about looking after number one and not caring about what comes next and instant gratification and what can I have and can I get it on credit card? Who cares what comes next? How do we do it? Well, we all invest and we all buy in to what God is trying to do through our community here, not just for the church today, but for the future of the church, for the future of this church, for the future of the church in our country, in the world. How do we be this community of faith that hands this on to the next generation? How do we be the baton handers? Well, I've got three words I want to explore that I think can help us as we endeavour to do this with God's help. First word there, Mace. Nice work. Loving. So in John 13, 34, it says, A new command I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now, in that one verse, love is mentioned four times, so I'm pretty sure that's the main theme of it. <laughs> Haven't had a good look. It's important to God. Love is important. When we're together in church on a Sunday, it's the perfect chance to practice and model Jesus' love. We won't get it right all the time, and we will never do it as well or as perfectly as Jesus. But we are called to try. As we practice this on Sundays, by serving and listening and caring and putting others' needs before our own, we improve the world around us in two ways. Firstly, we show the younger generation what God's love looks like in a practical, accepting and safe environment. We model it within this environment that we can create where it's safe to show those things. And secondly, we start to see his love permeating out into our everyday lives. Like a muscle that we train as we imitate Christ's love on Sundays, we start to notice we're less judgmental on Mondays, more understanding on Tuesdays, and more empathetic on Wednesdays. I've certainly noticed this in my own life. For long periods of time, I would have considered myself what some people might call a Sunday Christian. I would turn up to church, raise my hands, praise God loudly, not along with the preaching. I'd talk about how great God was after the service. And then 
I'd go home, put the Knights game on, swear at the TV, tell the kids not to bother me. I'd carry on like a pork chop. I'd drag people down. I was narcissistic and selfish. It wasn't until the last couple years of actually being involved and planted in the church through serving and spending time with other Christians outside Sunday services that the real love of God started shining through in my life outside of those 90 minutes on a Sunday morning. Now, I'm still massively a work in process. So and the kids can attest to that. But I'm so much better than I was, and that's thanks to investing in this community and accepting God's grace completely. Point number two. Nice. Teaching. Psalm 78, 1 to 4 in the New Living Translation. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, Stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his mighty wonders. Now, when I was looking for a teaching verse, I didn't expect to find one that perfect, but when it popped up, I was like, wow. Okay. So many of us as older Christians, or you know, whether that's by age or maturity, have the opportunity to learn some of the have had the opportunity sorry to learn some of these hidden lessons from our past that the verse is referring to whether that's in quiet reflection as we read the bible and something new stands out or through discussion in life groups or after church or youth or alpha or like this whole message is centered around in church on a sunday morning sometimes the speaker brings a new perspective to something we've read for ourselves a thousand times I know for me, there's this specific kind of joy and wonder I feel about God's character or the Bible when something that I've often pondered drops from my head to my heart. I have that light bulb moment. There's suddenly, it suddenly makes sense to me. Something deep inside my spirit is stirred. When I feel this, I get so excited and encouraged. And this excitement leads me to want to pass this on to everyone, but specifically the next generation, my children, other people's children. I want to pass this on. Now, I believe we weren't shown these things and encouraged and inspired by the Holy Spirit and the Bible and our community just to keep them to ourselves like secrets. Jesus wants the world to know this message. And in his great commission, his instructions on how to get his life-saving message to the world, he said, go and make disciples. Now, Traditionally, in the rabbi-disciple relationship, the disciple follows in the footsteps of the rabbi, both metaphorically and in ancient times, literally. They ate what the rabbi ate. They walked where the rabbi walked. They slept where the rabbi slept. They copied what the rabbi did. That was the closeness of that relationship. Sound familiar? This is the relationship that we can share with our children, that parents and children can have. We can be that teaching example for them. Jesus called us as parents and family figures in the church to disciple and teach the next generation, the children. This brings me to point three, modelling. Not short verse this time. 1 Corinthians 11.1, Paul says in this, And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Now, Paul isn't saying in this verse, copy me all the time and do everything I do, even if it seems ridiculous. He's saying, when I'm getting it right and I'm imitating Christ, then you should imitate me. If we are showing love and practicing what we teach and preach to the next generation, they will be compelled to copy this. This is why it's so important we are in community, learning from and teaching each other how to be Christians, little Christ, Jesus followers, because we have the immense privilege and responsibility of being looked up to by the young ones of our community. They will at some point model what we are doing. Let that sink in. They will at some point model what we are doing. They just will. That's how it works. I know I did when I was a kid. I know my kids do. I'm pretty sure it's been the way since the world was created. We need to remember that. If we are modelling a loving, God-centred, others-focused community, we might just change their world. 
Now, this is an immense privilege and one of the greatest joys as a Christian or parent or guiding figure in a young person's life. For me, there's nothing more encouraging than when it's dinner time and Parker models me by saying, Hey, Dad, we haven't prayed yet. And I'm usually stuffing my face full of food and I'm trying to pray through chewing. But I love it when he thinks of that and pulls me up because I've modelled that behaviour to him over time. The flip side of this is that it is a huge responsibility and something that God has given us corporately as a church stewardship over. Now, we need to be good and faithful stewards of this because it is of immense eternal importance. Just as our children and the next generation will imitate us as we imitate Christ, they will also, unfortunately, imitate us as we imitate the world, right? They're going to imitate either way. It's what we're showing that they're going to imitate. That's why it's so important that we model this behaviour. This is not to say we should expect to be anything close to perfect on this side of eternity, but we should, as a community, aim to get it right far more often than we get it wrong. And when we are not doing this, we need to lovingly hold each other accountable. That is important in the church. That's what we're called to do. Now, as I ask the team to come back up to the stage, there are some people in the room that I want to take a minute to focus on before I close. These people take time out of their week every Sunday evening during the school term to do exactly the three points I've highlighted. They love, they teach, and they model the life of Jesus to the next generation in our church. I'm talking about our wonderful youth leader, Jess, and her amazing team, who I think all who are here are on the stage. All right. We've got a lot of them away because we're not in terms, so they're taking a break because being a youth leader is hectic. <laughs> if you feel comfortable, um, Jess, I'd love you to stand up so we can pray for you. Tommy boy. I mean, you're sitting, standing. Yeah, awesome. I'd love to pray for these guys. And if you feel comfortable, I'd love you to raise your hands towards them. I want to pray blessing and courage and an infilling of the Holy Spirit over their lives for next term as we run Youth Alpha for our young people and further encourage and teach them in their walk with Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you've given some of us here the opportunity to steward over the next generation, to teach them your love, your kindness, all the amazing things that we know in our heart, God. We pray the next term heading into Youth Alpha that we'll see an influx of young people and that for the ones that are already coming, it will really cement their faith and their understanding of you, God. We know how important it is that our young people know and understand you and have a relationship with you, Jesus. We pray that you'll help us to provide that space, to teach them, to answer questions that they have, and that you'll empower us through your Holy Spirit to do this well. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right. Every week at Beyond Church, we like to make space for people to respond to the call of Jesus on their lives. Now, maybe today while I've been talking, something's stirring inside of you. That's the Holy Spirit nudging you. It's Jesus knocking on the door of your heart. And I want to give you a chance to respond. Maybe for the first time in your life, or maybe you want to recommit to a life of walking with Him and having the Holy Spirit dwell inside of you. So we're all going to pray together. And if it's the first time saying it for you or the first time saying it in a while, then please come and talk to myself or someone in the next step stand after the service. We'd love to chat to you about it. So we can have every eye closed and every head bowed. Uh, and you can either repeat this after me or if you feel more comfortable, echo it in your heart. Jesus, this is my decision. Today I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Come into my life, forgive my sin, and fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Awesome, awesome. So my final thought as we conclude is this. When we gather as a community and model what a strong community of Christ can do and be through His power, not our own, through His power. We engage our young people in a way that is not normal of the world around us. 
and we can create a space for something amazing to happen for and through the next generation. It is my prayer and belief that by being all together in this one place, the church, we can raise the next generation of leaders, spiritual warriors and influencers to change their world and lead a new generation to Jesus and maybe even start a revival. But just like David, we may not be around to see it and that's okay because I know that God has called us to pay the sacrifice for the foundation for them to finish this temple nonetheless. Thanks, Sammy.